Well, welcome everyone to the Anvil and Hammer episode number two, which is foreign language for three. Yes. Sarah, why don't you tell everyone what we're planning on doing? Well, what we're planning on doing is we're going to break it down. Jane Austen in dude speech. Yeah, so the idea is that if you're a man who knows nothing about Jane Austen or her books and you happen to have a wife like myself or you know someone who is an appreciator of Jane Austen, you can have a conversation with them without having to do all the long work of watching the films, which you'll probably be forced to do in the future, or having to read the novels themselves. So hopefully you'll be able to use this in the future in discussions. And we're going to present it in dude speak. So it's in language that men can understand. Okay. There we go. Sarah, you've been to the Jane Austen Museum. I have to say, I've never seen a picture of you where you're so happy wearing a bonnet. <laughs> oh, yes. That um, was one of the best holidays I've ever been on, apart from the ones that we've shared. But a few years ago... I, I was fortunate enough not to actually be a part of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mother, my wonderful mother, brought my sister and I, my older sister, on a Jane Austen themed holiday. We went to Bath in Somerset, which is a place where Jane Austen lived for a chunk of her life. And it's where a lot of books, not necessarily based, but the characters visit Bath quite frequently in a lot of her books. And it was an amazing holiday, so full of history and Jane Austen-ness. Oh, it was amazing. And at the very bottom level of this museum, you could actually dress up. There's like, it was like it was for kids. There's just boxes of costumes and you could just like dress up. But I put a bonnet on for the first time and it was, it was pretty cool. You were pretty happy. I was pretty happy. And I have to say, I don't think it, it didn't not suit me. You know, if I did live in those times and I had to wear bonnets, I think it'd be okay. Sarah, you look like a milkmaid. <laughs> Is that the worst thing to be? No, it's not. <laughs> That's wrong with milk babes. It's, a, no, it's, yeah, a, it's, it's an honorable job. job. It is. And milk is nice. So, Sarah, what you're going to do is you're going to explain to us two of Jane Austen's books in dude speak. Is that yeah. correct? That is correct. Or it's partially correct because this episode is not just about breaking down Jane Austen for guys. Obviously, we're going to bring it back to the Bible. Even though I am a Jane Austen enthusiast, I have a love-hate more love, but a love-hate relationship with her because when reading her novels, we get a glimpse into what life was like in her time. So as Christians, it's always good to view things, even if we really love them, through the lenses of God's word. Jane Austen wasn't a Christian, so these aren't Christian novels. And we could say they were uh, in, at a time where Christianity had a huge influence on the culture. But Jesus teaches in Matthew twelve thirty that you're either for him or against them. You're either gathering or you're scattering. So you're either doing something which is furthering the kingdom of God on earth, or you're doing something which is hindering or preventing that cause. So we have to view all these things in that light. I'll just quickly mention, it might be a, an area of slight contention among Christians, because I know there are lots of Christians, including myself, who really love works from that time, because you know, we can we tend to have rose tinted glasses and be like, oh, it was such a better time because there was modesty and sensibility, decorum, yeah, there's moralism no... matters, you know, all that all that lark. But really what I'm going to argue is that in many ways it was no different or no more godly than the age in which we live today. And there's no mention of slaves, are they? They sort of brush over that whole thing, do they? In, in, in Jane the Austen? Yeah. Oh, well, there is a reference in her novel Mansfield Park. I don't think there's... A, any other explicit mention or implicit mention in any of her other novels. I'm open for a correction there because I haven't read all of them. Uh, read her major ones. Yeah, it is kind of glanced over in Mansfield Park. She doesn't take a moral stance on the issue. She just more kind of passively mentions it. One of the issues is there isn't really anybody of a of a class that low, if you want to say, depicted in her novels. And again, I'm open for correction, but yeah, her father was a vicar. So for those who don't know, a vicar is a minister in the Church of England. Just want to clear that up. Yes, and her family was a bit odd because while her father was a gentleman, he was part of the gentry, 
he was also a vicar, which was considered to be a relatively humble position. It's not something that somebody of a certain class or, you know, upper class would 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 join. You know, they wouldn't te- they didn't tend to join the church, but she would have never depicted a really low class like that. It was always characters kind of start out off in an upper class and then, you know, they, they end up in an impoverished position or something like that so why don't we get into it jane austen a dude speak i'm first going to talk about my personal favorite book and my sister's persuasion sarah persuaded me to watch it recently after seven years anyway and i, was I deli- hope you have better luck with your husband ladies and i was delighted to find that christian bale features in that film oh, no she's a handsome woman once she's you, not Christian Bale. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. <laughs> the lead character, she in, in the nineteen ninety five adaptation, she is a handsome woman. I'll just say has that. an uncanny resemblance to Christian Bale. Anyway, Rachel. persuasion, <laughs> persuasion, in dude speak. Right. Persuasion in dude speak. By I have to say who it's by too. Persuasion in dude speak by Sarah Bradford. No, no, it's by Jane Austen. Persuasion. By by oh. Jane Austen in Do Speak. So, Persuasion. We have Shy Anne. Okay, she's the protagonist. She comes from a rich family. Her mother's dead. Her father is a pretentious spendthrift slash social climber. So she was persuaded by a nosy lady friend to reject the proposal of a charming Poe guy. Right? So he's Poe. But she was about 19 and he was like, oh no. So he went and joined the Navy. So the big fancy house in which they live in the danger of being repossessed so they're basically reduced to having to rent out the house which is shocking for the time so they rent it out to charming po guy's sister and she's like oh no so they're all packing up to go to bath to save money so she goes to see her hypochondriac younger sister and spend time with her and the in-laws and who shows up but charming po guy except he's no longer charming po guy he is now captain charming rich guy but he's not too charming, isn't he? We'll get into that. Well, as in right now, we'll get into that. So hypochondriac sister has... What's a hypochondriac? A hypochondriac is somebody who fancies they're ill all the time. Someone who thinks they're ill all the time. Yes. So someone who's crazy. So hypochondriac younger sister has some female in-laws. And, you know, when Captain Charming Rich Guy sees Cheyenne, he's all like... Oh, I can't believe she rejected. Look, look at me, like I'm all rich now. So he starts flirting with the female relatives of the hypochondriac younger sister. That leads to one of the female relatives doing something really stupid to get his attention, and she ends up like nearly dying. That wakes him up, and he's like, "Oh no, what have I done?" Because he had no intention of marrying her, so he basically threatened the reputation of these girls. Enter secretly evil persistent guy because he's got evil plans and Anne's all like hmm no but like nosy lady friend is all like ah go on go on go on and she's like ah no I don't really want to know she's trying to persuade her to marry him captain charming rich guy basically realizes the folly of his ways and he's humbled now he's captain charming humbled rich guy the evil not so secret anymore persistent guy's plans are foiled and they get married live happily ever after after. that's it no persuasion that is the condensed version you're welcome. That is the severely condensed version. I mean, there's so much more going on, but in a nutshell, that's it. Yeah. So now you never have to read the book or watch the TV show. All you have to do is Excuse try me. and remember the little details from that. So round one is complete. Round two is oh, Pride, Pride and Prejudice. Round two, Pride and Prejudice in Dude Speak. Maybe I've got to say it in the voice. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Dude Speak version. Dude version condensed dude version <laughs> prime project they have the benefits they're a upper middle class family who's a aloof and apathetic dad and hysterical silly mother they have a bunch of daughters only three really being important mainly the oldest pretty one jane mouthy one elizabeth and the i call her the hellish chicken one lydia basically do nothing but true love for soldiers because apathetic dad has no male heir and if the daughters don't marry well everything will go to creep your vicar cousin Mr. Collins. The two rich guys come into town, Mr. Lovable Dope, Mr. Bingley, and uh, Mr. Stuffed Shirt, Mr. Darcy. Lovable Dope quickly falls in love with Pretty Sister, and Stuffed Shirt thinks, oh, the mouthy one is, she's attractive, but no, he turns his nose up at her because, you know, they're 
they're not as upper class as he is. Another guy comes in to the scene, which is handsome scoundrel soldier, Mr. Wickham. All the girls, of course, they are, are taken to his charms, particularly mouthy Elizabeth. So what he does is he tells lies to mouthy Elizabeth about Mr. Darcy, Mr. Stuff Shirt, about him not giving him an inheritance and preventing him from joining the church and stuff like that. Creepy vicar cousin, Mr. Collins, comes into town and wants to do the mother and dad a favour by marrying one of the girls. And he sets his sights on Matthew Elizabeth, who refuses him immediately. She's like, her forgettable friend, I can't even remember her name. She marries him instead and moves to his parish where, coincidentally, Mr. Stuffed Shirt Darcy's aunt lives. She's the Catherine de Bourgh. Meanwhile, Mr. Stuffed Shirt, he persuades Mr. Lovable Dope to leave the pretty sister, uh, which he subsequently does, and they leave. And uh, then Mouthy Elizabeth, she goes on a holiday with her aunt and uncle. She runs into Mr. Stuffed Shirt, who's all like, marry me, even though I think your family are peasants and it goes against my will and better judgment to marry you. And she's like, no, thanks. What about what the scoundrel, the handsome scoundrel soldier told me? And why did Mr. Lovable Dope leave? And all like that. And he's like, oh, scoundrel, shakes fist. And he storms off and furiously writes a very well put together letter for her to read describing this scandalish past of the handsome scandal soldier guy. The mouthy girl reads it and she's all like, oh no. She ends up visiting Mr. Stuff Shirt's amazing estate and she's like, I love him. So she's a gold digger. And then she runs into him and it's like so awkward. And But then she receives a letter from her family. Basically that the headless chicken younger sister has run off with the handsome scoundrel soldier. It's like, oh, scandal. And she's like, oh no. But Mr. Stuffed Shirt, he comes in and saves the day and he essentially pays the handsome scoundrel soldier to marry the hellish chicken sister. So he turns out to be the knight in shining armor. So they all go back. Mr. Lovable Dope comes back. He proposes to the pretty sister. She accepts him. And then knight in shining armor, Mr. Darcy, he proposes to the mouthy one, Elizabeth. And they have a double wedding and the house doesn't go to the creepy vicar cousin and they all live happily after after. The The end. end. Well, there you go. There you have it. Now, I have had the privilege of sitting down and watching some of these films with Sarah. And some of them are quite hilarious. There's one where at a certain scene in the background, uh, this guy is walking down these steps. And (laughs) I noticed this in the background. And I was just thinking, I bet you the editor is going to forget about that guy walking in the background. And then she cuts to like a close up of like the girl. And then it goes back to the wide with like the background of the guy walking down the stairs. But he's higher up the stairs instead of lower. And I was like, ha, continuity error. And that was Emma, the TV version of Emma. I think it might be BBC. Mr. Knightley walking down the steps to see Emma. And one has a duel. That's pretty cool. This guy, he takes a glove, slaps him in the face, says, I'm going to duel you. And they duel it out for honor. Yes. One thing about watching these shows is that it's quite refreshing because you're actually seeing, for most instances, a positive representation of men. You're actually seeing men, uh, manly men, men depicted in quite a good light in a lot of instances, obviously not all of them, compared to our sort of feminist, heavy, anti-men, men are idiots, men can't do anything culture today. If you are going to watch this with your wife, or whoever take note of that i think that's one thing that men can sort of get out of these films and tv shows is that they've got a pretty good representation of men explain to us some of the negatives of the book or how is the church represented in the writings of jane austen so from what i see there mainly tends to be uh, the, the the church or the role of the vicar tends to be depicted in mostly two ways Either the characters in it that are vicars are either kind of like that, you know, sleazy, self-righteous or hypocrites, or it's kind of seen as a career. It's never really seen as a genuine calling. You see, the thing is with, she never, in her book, she never depicts Christianity in an overtly negative light. I suppose my issue with the books is that Jane Austen is a social commentator, right? So she basically writes about what she sees. The thing that saddens me when I read her books is that she clearly, by her depiction of the church and the clergy in her books, doesn't see genuine faith around her. Jane Austen's father, being a vicar, you'd think that would expose her to genuine faith. But 
from her books, you really do not get the sense that she thinks Christianity is important in your personal life. You have a tendency to look back at the past, as I said, with rose tinted glasses and think, oh, you know, back then it was more moral, it was more modest, it's more respectable and all those things. But the what when you read Jane Austen's works or even watch them, you really see that the characters were only concerned about keeping the reputation clean. So one scripture that comes to mind when viewing all of this comes from James chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and your corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Likewise, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25, he says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the model of Christ is that he doesn't dominate people with his authority, is that he comes to earth and he suffers with us, and he is amongst us as a servant, wiping tables, washing our feet. I suppose in these books, Jane Austen's books, there's quite a lot about the upper class, the wealthy, and how they spend their money. Do you think there's a sense of envy in her books? Oh, I, I wish I was this wealthy. Yeah, I definitely, my personal opinion is yes. She had a very rich older brother who her parents adopted out and uh, he grew up in a very fancy estate. He had a great inheritance. He had 15,000 a year. So Darcy himself only had 10,000 a year. So that kind of puts it in perspective how wealthy he was. So she had a, she saw a glimpse of that. And she definitely glamorized in her novels the lives of the upper class. And she does portray the upper class in, in, in different ways. You know, she does per- definitely portray some as being stuck up and pretentious and snobbish. And uh, she doesn't necessarily depict wealth in a great light all the time. But she definitely glamorizes wealth. Like we see, you know, with Mr. Darcy and Pemberley, <laughs> Elizabeth was arguably really only swayed to consider Mr. Darcy when she visited his estate. And she was like, wow, I, I, I'm I, crazy. I turned down being lady of this whole estate, you know. And then when it comes to relationships, uh, I suppose Austin herself never married. Many people know she had a couple of proposal, you know, offers which I think is really important. You shouldn't get any no. marriage advice from these books, seeing well, that this woman was never married herself. Yeah, well, we, we were reading a book when sinners say I do. And in the book, I skipped ahead, he actually mentions Jane Austen. And he mentions exactly what I was going to say in this podcast, which is all of her books stop right before marriage. They start right after, They sorry, they stop after acceptance of, of a proposal and you never see the characters in their married lives together, which I think is a very important element because as Christians, we would say your lives start from marriage. Marriage is the most important part, whereas she seems to make the build up to marriage the most important part, you know, romance and all this kind of stuff. Well, she, I suppose in, in her experience, that's where it ends. She she had probably only ever known infatuation. She had mm-hmm. never gone and actually been married. So... She had to end her books. If she's basing her writings on her experience as a social commentator, she has to stop before marriage because she never was married. So in a, in a sense for her, marriage is always this maybe mystical thing or where, you, where the story ends. Hmm. You know, they live happily ever after. As much as I love Austen and, you know, the secular world and even Christians love Austen, I think that her work is a hotbed of false expectations since becoming a Christian, I definitely take Jane Austen with a large pinch of salt. Seems to be quite shallow as well. It seems that the characters are, the men are only worthy. Like we know the criteria for, for marriage is that a man loves God and that he has the characteristics 
of God. He has the attributes. He's like Jesus. And there it seems, is their requirements. Yeah. Yes. And it seems that in her books, it seems to be more about, is he wealthy? How much land does he own? That, that philosophy itself is not biblical. The Bible would be more concerned that this man is a hard worker because money comes and goes. So not the fact that he has money, but is he willing to work with his hands? If a man does not work, he does not eat. Definitely. So that's the characteristic. The Bible would say that a man must provide for his household. If he doesn't, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. Mm. So that is the characteristic, not wealth, which wealth seems, that doesn't seem to even come into the equation in her novels. It seems to be wealth is the the goal the, yeah the main issue for me with Austin's work is the depiction of Christianity and the lack of genuine faith there seemed to have been around her it seemed to be more of a cultural thing to be a Christian Definitely. just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you are Jesus said that a good tree does not produce bad fruit nor does a bad tree produce good fruit by their fruits you will know them so not everyone who says to me Lord Lord went to the kingdom of heaven at the end of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus explained that. So just because people say they're a Christian doesn't actually mean that they're born again in the universal church of God or part of the redeemed. Okay, I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining in for that. I think it's hammer time. So hammer time is where we hammer out truth from a passage of the Bible, biblical truth. Okay. So we have Psalm 84, verses 10 to 11. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. I think the last part of that is really important. No good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that's the allure of sin. Sin is saying God is holding back. There's a, there's a superior pleasure through doing this. And if you, if you believe the lie, you'll die. But the scripture says there's no good thing that God withholds. So th- if, you don't, if you're not receiving this thing that you're wanting to get through sin, it's for your good. God is withholding it for a reason. And he does not withhold good from those who walk uprightly. So we also see this contrast between being in the courts of the Most High and being in the tents of wickedness. The idea is that the tents of wickedness are temporary dwellings, but the courts on high are eternal. And it's better to be a doorkeeper in the eternal courts than be in the tents of wickedness. Mm, definitely. And this psalm was also written by the sons of Korah. And Korah was the man who rebelled against Moses and the ground opened up and they fell straight into Sheol. So it's interesting that they they write this, that it's better to be with God in his courts as a subject than to be striving to rule as their fathers were. Okay, so at the end of each episode, we're going to play the Armory Bible board game, which you can download at thearmoryboardgame.com. We've already done an attack challenge. We're now moving on to defense and after that, utility So at the beginning of each game, a player does an attack, defense, and utility challenge, which are all Bible challenges. And the points they score from this will determine which class they play. The game master, which is what I'm playing at the moment, will then allocate that class. And once we do that, you get represented on the board, you start progressing in the game, doing more challenges, and you defeat the boss, the monster, which represents sin, and you unlock quests, which you can do outside of the game, sort of uh, things that you can customize, like read the Bible, for instance, read the Gospel of Mark, which is the sort of set built in one there. And the download you get. Do you want to pick one? Pick a card, pick any card. Yoink. Okay. Scripture reference. The game master will read a scripture to you in 10 seconds. Tell, tell the game master the following about scripture. So, Old New Testament for one defense point, book for two defense points. Chapter for three defense points, or verse for four defense points. The above shows what each correct answer will reward, totaling to ten defense points. Okay, so video timer, ready? Yeah. So I gotta read the scripture first. <laughs> yeah. For a day in your courts is better than a oh. thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Oh, no. 
Okay, you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, go. Old Testament Psalms, oh, Psalm 54, verse 5 to 6. Okay, so it's Psalm 84, verses 10 to 11. So you got three defense points. So that's one thing you do as a game master is that see if people are paying attention <laughs> and are actually learning the content that you are covering. So eight, Psalm 84. Verses 10 to 11. 10 to 11. Okay. So this, this could be a good tool if you're playing with your family and someone is distracted or talking when someone is doing a challenge. And that way you can make a note of it. And when it comes to their turn, you can then use that scripture. It's also good to see how much your spouse listens to you. Yeah, it's because the idea is you're trying to encourage your family or whoever you're playing with to learn the Bible. So you're not trying to, hey, I got you, catch you out. It's trying to encourage memorization. It is, but that was kind of a catch you out. It was a little bit of a one. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the anvil and hammer. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Hope you learned something. Hope you've been encouraged. Please uh, subscribe, like, follow, share, and tell your friends about this podcast. We greatly appreciate that because if it helped you, if it blessed you, it's probably going to bless someone else as well. So share it, like it, subscribe it, and all that stuff. So you can also check out the armorybibleboardgame.com for more episodes, more content, and of course the Armory Bible board game adventure for your family and friends free download make sure you play it love to hear your feedback and i uh, will see you some other time goodbye yeah that's another thing we quickly mention um if any of you guys have played it please let us know um yeah that would be really helpful for us if you played it at all just give a few comments uh there you go right yeah take care